he showed me this drawing and this photograph. So this picture right here, she married a man named Ernest Nosworthy. He was a Shakespearean actor and he was an artist. And he often traveled. And while he was at these different hotels, he would take the paper from the hotels and he would draw things and send them to her. So in 1890, which is when the back of this paper is dated from the hotel, he sent this to her with a letter, and this is what she looked like when she named the Ouija board. And as Jean pointed out, it looks a lot like Snow White, and maybe, you know, like little seven dwarfs here. These are like little brownies, but it does look like uh, Snow White. This is a, the only picture we thought we had of her when she was older. But I told you I was in Denver, and while I was in Denver at this paranormal conference, I visited Helen Peters' grave, which, by the way, doesn't have her name on it. She also has an unmarked grave. So all of you people who bought tickets, thank you. You're paying for her gravestone. Yay! <laughs> so while we're there, she's buried with very distant members of her family. The people who own the plot of where she's buried, um, their grandmother was best friends with Helen Peters. And so they brought all of these albums and we're looking through and they're crumbling. I'm just like, oh my God, you know, we're looking through it. And sure enough, we're, we're, we're pulling the pictures, they're all pasted. You know, you've all seen your grandmother's the photo albums, they're all pasted. You're like, oh geez, I don't want it. And as we flip this over, this photo says Nosworthy. Now, if you look at this and you look at her, it's pretty much a dead ringer, I think. So we don't know for sure because, you know, grandmother's not alive, but I think that's her. So you're looking, again, you guys are this, only the second audience to see this face. This is the face of the woman who named the Ouija board. And kind of unique because um, she was written out of the history and now thanks to all of this, she's right there back in there. So how does the Ouija board work, right? So I found in talking to people, people fall into these three different banks, right? Um, scientists believe it's something called idiomotor response the marrying of the small muscle movements in your hands and your subconscious, right? How many people have been like driving home from work and you're thinking about, oh, I gotta go to the grocery store, I gotta let out the dog, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. And then you realize, oh my God, like I've taken turns, I've stopped at stoplights and I didn't hit anybody. Your brain kind of takes care of yourself, right? Like your subconscious does not want you to crash the car and die. So it, it stops you from doing that. So, you know, imagine that on this level where you're made of muscles and you don't want to stay still. Remember when you were little and your, the kindergarten teacher would line you all up at the thing and say, now everyone stand still. And you find yourself being like, ooh, because it's hard. You just don't want to stay still, right? Especially your hands. And so your hands naturally want to move. And because you want the board to work, your hands, unbeknownst to you, start moving. Your subconscious takes those small movements, makes them fluid, and answers the questions. So scientists believe it's you. You're the ones that answering the questions, you just don't know it. Then some psychics believe that there's a form of telepathy, that what's happening is you're sitting at the board, you're asking a question, and you're starting to read each other's minds, and that's what's happening. And then there's the very popular belief that you're talking to something other than you. It's not you, not the other person you're playing with, not your subconscious, something exterior. Could be a spirit. Today, according to Hollywood, Demons are really popular things to talk to. You're gonna get a chance to talk to someone who believes that uh, they had a demonic experience. Anyone heard of Zozo? Yes. So uh, that's another reason a lot of people don't like to play the Ouija board. People don't like to talk to Zozo, but you're gonna have another speaker who will tell you about his experience with Zozo. And so you have these three competing beliefs. And uh, as Jean also pointed out, it doesn't matter whether you believe. So what you think you're talking to is it super important when you play the Ouija board or to admire its artwork? So if you go through the museum we have set up here, you will see that from artist interpretations or from manufacturing interpretations, they're just beautiful and they're a reflection of our pop culture and that's really cool too. So here we go, like Ouija's popularity and we have many debates on this and so all we can say is that when we look at newspaper accounts of the Ouija board, they tend to go up in hits during times of war or you know, um, economic uncertainty. And people are writing about them more. 
and, and it, it makes sense. It doesn't. It doesn't always play out, and it's tough. But we see more advertisements, so we see this happening, and it makes sense, right? Like when you're uncertain or you don't have a lot of money, you know, you you turn kind of inward, and, and we have seen that. No, Elijah Bond. So who's Elijah Bond? Elijah Bond is uh, an attorney in Baltimore who meets Charles Kennard when Charles Kennard comes to Baltimore, and he loves this idea. He's like, we can do this. So, so Elijah Bond takes this great idea of the talking board, and he cleans it up, and he files for a patent. And as you know, this is Elijah Bond's sister-in-law, Helen Peters. So that's what they do. I'm really lucky to have that photo of Elijah Bond because I got to meet his great-grandnephew in 2007, who was 99 years old at the time, who knew his uncle Elijah. And so when I call up his daughter, it's like dead silent, and I'm like, oh, this is bad, because I'm, I'm explaining it to me, no response. And she says, son of a bitch. And I'm like, what? And she said, my dad always said our family had something to do with the Ouija board, and we didn't believe him. We always told him he was full of shit. <laughs> so, so I'm laughing, like, oh God, okay, cool. At least I thought she was gonna hang up on me. Um, and so, you know, well, I mean, you hear the story, how many people have family stories? Oh, my great-grandfather invented the Hostess cupcake, but Hostess stole it and, you know, took it. Well, it's always these stories. So you never know if it's true, but that was, uh, so she said, you have to meet my dad. Like, you have to meet him. He's gonna be so excited that someone believes him. So we set up a meeting, a bit in haste, because he's 99. And, um, you know, it was really cool. So I got to meet him. This man was, um, Walter Dent, was about this tall at 99. So I don't know how tall he was when he was younger, because he already shrunk. He was a giant. And uh, he had all of his faculties. He told the story about knowing his Uncle Elijah. And they found those photographs. So up until then, Elijah Bond was just a name. But because of these family members, again, I'm gonna stress this, we're able to put faces on these people. So the real story of the Ouija board is about the people, the people who play it, the people who talk about it, and the people who made it. That's really key. So unfortunately, I got invited to uh, Walter's 100th birthday to come in there. He didn't make it to that. Um, he actually died a few months after I interviewed him, which was, um, unfortunate for everybody, but fortunate that we were able to talk to him. He was a great guy. So in 2008, I talked about Greenmount Cemetery. Um, before he passed away, really weird timing. Timing is everything with this, and, and I know we like to look into things and make them romantic, and I'm, I'm a skeptic, so I believe in everything's chance, but the Ouija board, things get a little weird around the Ouija board. So I find him, and two weeks later, I finally find the unmarked grave of Elijah Bond, right under my nose, Greenmount Cemetery. How did, I, how did I miss this? Well, first of all, I had been calling for years cemeteries. Does anyone have any idea how many burial grounds in Maryland there are? Like, hundreds. <laughs> and I called as many as I could. Some of them are in people's backyards, some of them are in churches. Um, and so I'm in Greenmount Cemetery, very popular cemetery, beautiful cemetery in uh, Baltimore, and I finally say, you know, his son's buried here, and his wife's buried here. It's odd to me that he's not. Is there any way I can look at the original records? And they say, no, no, we can't do that. And, and Greenmount Cemetery, historic landmark, um, federally, and so they're not digitized, so they're like, no, we're nervous, it's a, you know, a card catalog, and I'm like, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna hurt your card catalog. Like, I promise, I, I will, you know, so it, it finally, they work it out, that they bring me um, the, the whole row, and I'm flipping through it, and as I do, I notice there's a card stuck to the back of his son's card. And as I peel it off, there's Elijah Bond, buried, right underneath my nose. So there he is, we find him, and I, I talk to our group of collectors and, and, and some friends in the finance world, and we group together a bunch of money, and we put this stone in. So this is his patent drawing on the back. And so now, if you go to Greenmount Cemetery, you can view this monument that we all put in. So this is the, the beginning of the Talking Board Historical Society, trying to catalog and then celebrate. Cool thing about this is, who knows who else is buried in Greenmount Cemetery? Any idea? Nope, John Wilkes Booth. Pretty popular guy. 
right? So um, and if you go there, by the way, people on the, in his monument, his family's monument, put pennies reversed, Lincoln's head on the monument. So that's a bit of like a Confederate place to go visit and see. Well, once we put this in and we thought, oh, yay, this is cool, look at for us. You know, we do this, no one cares. Um, it, it's kind of funny because today, it is the single most requested grave in the cemetery. It beat uh, John Wilkes Booth for people who come in and ask, where is this stone? So it's pretty cool. And what's really unique to me today was funny. I was walking around the vendor room and I picked this up. So it's now a postcard. So it's really weird when you do something that you love and you do it for fun and it takes on a life of itself, which is exactly what all of this has done. So here you go. So patents, you get patents because you've done something new. You've invented something that no one's ever done before, right? Well, okay, let's look at this 1886 picture and drawing that was again ran Baltimore Sun, Chestertown Transcript, Kent County News. Let's look at this patent. It looks an awful lot like that, but it helps when you have money. And uh, Harry Wells Rusk was a senator. He was also in the House of Delegates. He was also a patent attorney. So when this was applied for, it helps when you have friends at the top. So here we go. Like this is what the Ouija board looked like in the beginning. The Kendrick Novelty Company made this. This doesn't look like the planchette you're used to, does it? It looks like a ping pong paddle, actually. And we don't know why he picked that shape. We can guess that, it's, remember that article called it the new planchette? So we can guess that because the planchette had been so popular, as Brendan had talked about, that he didn't want it to look the same, so he came up with this. We don't know, I'm, I'm really just guessing here, but you know, may, it would make sense. William Fold, how many people have heard Ouija boards, William Fold? A lot of you, right, especially anyone from Baltimore. So we call William Fold the father of the Ouija board because he was one of the original investors in the Kennard Novelty Company, and he was one of the original employees. And by 1893, 1894, he would be put in charge. By 1897, he would start working with his brother, licensing the Ouija board. By 1901, he was the single licensee of the Ouija board, the only person making it. So he'd been around from the beginning. He'd been making Ouija boards and his family right up until 1966, when it was sold to Parker Brothers. So it's kind of cool, and when you're a historian, again, remember I, I kind of mentioned before that it's easy to look at things through how you see things today. So collecting every, my answer to this is, okay, then I won't just collect Ouija boards, I'll collect everything Ouija board related, my husband's site, right? He's in the back right there, he loves the fact that our house is just a museum to the Ouija board. So there's Gary, he has to put up with this, thank you, Gary. Um, and our, again, like, as you look in there, our house looks like it was robbed. There's like actually light spots on the walls where some of the things come from. Um, I'm sure by the time I get back, Gary will have completely redecorated. <laughs> there will be no more room. So in 1901, we see this depiction of a Ouija board kind of leak into pop culture. The song, there's a charm about the old love still. And you see a man and a woman, a little cherub. Not, not really the evil thing you think of today, right? Well, what's interesting is, is why would the Ouija board be popular in the Victorian era, right? You're talking about a time when men and women aren't really supposed to be alone together if you're not married, and here you are playing in the dark, and your knees are touching, and your fingers are here, and so this is a great date game. Like, nothing changes, right? So women might be playing this to talk to the other side, and men are like, oh, I want to talk to the other side. <laughs> and you'll see this a little bit more later. So when something's popular, what happens? Competition. But there's a talking board patent. This works the same way. Now what's interesting is this looks more like what you're used to when you say planchette, right? And um, so this is made by the same company that made the witch board in 1886. So maybe the witch board wasn't popular in 1886, maybe they only made one, but when they see Ouija come and go boom, because so let me put this into perspective. They start making their Ouija boards out of their offices, small office. Within three years, they go from one factory to two factories in Baltimore, two factories in Chicago, two factories in New York, and one in London. Boom. 
huge. So everyone wants a piece of the action. So maybe this company who didn't do well in 1886 says, hey, uh, we want to get here. So they make this called the Esperito. It's kind of a funny story. So collaboration, it's the only way this works because there's no way you have all the answers or all the pieces. This board used to show up on eBay all the time. And I personally thought it was like a homemade board. It just looks like someone did it themselves. And we saw a few of them. And um, you know, I picked one up, you know, $25, and was told, well, that's $25 you won't get back. So it sat on my wall. And um, I'm in Toronto, I'm researching, I'm stuck in a storm, so I go to the library, and I'm researching Ouija boards in Canada, because that's what everyone does when they're stuck in a storm <laughs> in a foreign country. So, um, and I, I find this article with a drawing in it of Ouija, the planchette, and the Esperito. And I'm like, cool. So I email Gene, and I say, oh my god, we have a drawing of um, the Esperito. Now we know what it looks like. And he writes me back in typical fashion, um, yeah, isn't that, don't you have that board? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And so he sends me the picture I sent back of him of this board. And so he, you know, I'm, I'm so involved and I'm so looking at it that I don't see that the drawing in this article is exactly the board that's sitting on my desk at home. So, um, so we figure out the Esperito and, um, and the planchette. Now, somehow, the WS Reed Company and the Ouija Novelty Company work out a deal. Whether they're bought out, whether whatever the deal is, they stop making it and tell everyone that they're out of the talking board business. If you want a Ouija board, go to the Ouija Novelty Company. We can't really compete with Ouija. So we do know that after that, they do something kind of unique. Um, we do know that they integrate this planchette. The paddle changes into the planchette. And so as far as we know, the Esperito is the first talking board to have a planchette-shaped planchette, if that makes any sense. Charles Kennard, I told you, to the dying day, said that he invented the Ouija board. So, he leaves the company in 1892, sells his stock, incorporates another company in Chicago where he was managing, and actually incorporates at the location of the branch factory, and starts making a board called the Volo board. The problem is he doesn't own the patent anymore. And his original people who were, have done it, they're pissed. Like, they are not happy. That he knew better, he did this, they go to federal court, they, they settle out of court, he stops making the bolo. But weird, in 1897, two doors down from his original factory, he comes back to Baltimore, and he makes this, the Ishley board. Now, there's only been a few of these that we know of that exist. Um, I was lucky enough to get this. Some guy from Maine called me and said, uh, I got this board called an Eagley board. And, uh, and I'm like, I, look, a couple weeks before that, uh, someone found the advertisement of the Ishley board that was from the American Toy Company. So we have no idea it's not attached to Charles Kenner. I find this board, he sells it to me, whopping $25, right? Pretty rare piece and an important piece of the history. I track this down with the help of the Maryland Archives. We get the incorporation papers for the American Toy Company. Boom. Who's the president? Charles Kenner. So he tries again. And, and have you, how many people have ever heard of the Ishley board before? Yeah, no one. I guess it didn't do very well, right? So um, not many people know about it. Here's another board. Shocking, right? Even the Nazis play Luigi. No. Look. So look at the date, 1907. Elijah Bond, who patents the Ouija board, also leaves the company by 1893. But he's smart. He saw what happened to Charles Kenner. He waits. The Bond patent, his former patent, expires in 1908, right? So at the end of 1907, he comes out with a new board called the Nirvana board and uses this symbol. Now, this symbol today looks an awful lot like the swastika we think of the Nazis. But at the time, and, and prior, that symbol had been used for lots of things. Good luck, power, good things. And so he used it. Poor choice. But at the time, it wasn't. And um, he made this board. And he made it for a couple of years, and, and like anything else, the Ouija was so popular that it just outlasted it. So Isaac Fold. We have some descendants here. So raise your hand. We have someone back here who's a descendant of Isaac Fold back here. We're really lucky. Um, Isaac Fold was William's older brother. And 
In 1897, as the Wheaton Company winds down, William's there from the beginning, he brings his brother in. They make the Ouija board under Isaac Bolden brother from 1897 to 1901. Now, 1901, something happens between these brothers. And we know that the Ouija Novelty Company only then licenses the board to be made with William. We don't know what the initial fight was, but this would start a feud that would last their entire lifetimes and would actually last 96 years, all right? Isaac, he's pretty pissed that he's cut out and that, like wants to continue making them. He keeps making the Ouija board, gets a, William gets an injunction against him three months after. So what do you do? You make your own. You make the Oriel board. Now, Oriel's perfect name for Baltimore, right? This is a good choice. Problem is, it looks a lot like the Ouija board, right? And I'll show you just how much. So this is the Ouija board at the time. This is the Oriel board. Now, Isaac would claim in court, because the brothers would fight for 20 years, who had the right to make the Ouija board. I'm not copying him. Now look, they're, they're digging each other. William's taking out ads and trade things, like you know, anyone who's infringing on my stuff, I'm gonna take to court. They're fighting back and forth. According to um, William's side of the family, uh, William's sons are riding on the back of trucks trying to see where they're delivering the Oriole boards so they can send them nasty letters and all kinds of things. So, you know, it's very personal. But Isaac's claiming, no, 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 no. I mean, my board looks nothing like the Ouija board. See? Okay. Now, it doesn't just look like the Ouija board, and I'm gonna show you why. So these are some stencils that were found by Stuart, who's the grandson of Isaac, and um, his sister Patsy. And according to Stuart, um, they were cleaning out with his father uh, some old trunks that had belonged to Isaac. And as they were pulling them up the stairs, it fell and kind of broke, and out of the bottom were these stencils. So they were hidden. Well, it's kind of weird, right? Like, why do you hide stuff? Well, so here's an Oriole stencil. Now here's this stencil. What do you think it's missing? The word Ouija, because he was making the board with his brother. So when you're pissed, now what do you do? Now, if you go into the museum, look at the stencil. It's really cool because, you know, if you're gonna make something, you just cut it out. But this is really jagged. You can't see it here, but he's like, so you can tell that he's actually like, okay, like we're gonna get you. So, so lucky for Isaac, these were not found at the time, um, but, but kind of a cool story. So um, in 1997, I told you I put up that horrible website, which did something really good besides making a lot of people laugh. Um, the granddaughter of William Fold and the grandson of Isaac Fold both contact me within a couple weeks. So they are both asking me questions, they are telling me things, and I'm like, ah, uh, hold on, I'm asking the other side the question. They know the answer. And I'm like in the middle, like right, I just tell my family. And um, I'm thinking, okay, so I talk to Kathy, who's the granddaughter of William Fold, and say, you know, I know you still have this feud, but I mean, you weren't alive, and this is, a, you, I mean, why carry this? And you're asking all these questions, only they know. Just, you know, here's his phone number. And one night, Kathy will.